Today's event is co-sponsored by the International Policy Center, and I would like to thank them for their help in making things possible uh, this evening. Well, with President Obama's second foreign policy team still very fresh in their new roles, we are especially pleased today to be joined by one of America's most highly regarded uh, authorities on the very important topic of U.S.-China relations. And um, there are both, of course, some immediate issues, but this is an evolving and uh, medium to longer term strategic challenge. And uh, having a better understanding of what's in play and how things may evolve over uh, the coming years is extremely valuable, I think, from so many different perspectives. So. We are particularly pleased to be joined by Dr. Ken Lieberthal, who is Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institute and former <coughs> Director of the John L. Thornton China Center. He also served as a member of the National Security Council under President Clinton. Um, there's a biography of Ken Lieberthal in your program, and so I invite you to take a look at that as well. But as uh, many, if not most of you know, uh, he's certainly no stranger to Michigan. And, <coughs> Um, we are very delighted to have him back here. Uh, he was, of course, a member of the faculty for uh, many, many years. He's a professor emeritus at uh, Michigan. And until, until 2009, he was an Arthur Thurnau professor of political science and William Davidson professor of business administration. During his time here at Michigan, he taught a number of different courses, but in particular, China's evolution under communism and doing business with China. And um, I, uh, I know that there are many of the themes from those country, uh, courses that are likely to feature in some of his uh, remarks this evening. Um, so he's going to talk about some of the unfolding policy experiences and challenges. And he has agreed to take questions as well. We will have staff collecting your questions um, around 440. And so I hope that you had the chance to take a card to write those questions on. Um, those of you who are watching online, or even those of you who are with us in the audience, are, of course, welcome to tweet your questions in to us. And uh, please use Policy Talks as the hashtag. Professor Phil Potter will select questions along with one of our graduate students, Christina Hodge. And um, they will then deliver the questions in the last part of our session. So it is a great pleasure and an honor to welcome Ken Lieberthal back to Michigan. Ken, Thank you. The floor is Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Susan. It really is a pleasure to be back here and uh, such a great university. I uh, have been looking forward to getting back and sometimes wonder why I ever left. But uh, uh, especially since it's so nice out today and the forecast is for snow by the time I get back at 11 p.m. tonight to uh, Washington. Uh, I'm going to talk about the overall framework uh, for the Obama administration's policy toward China during the coming four years uh, and uh, uh, cover an array of issues that the administration is wrestling with and where I think some of these are going. Uh, I want to make clear at the start that in the q and I'm happy for you to raise questions about anything so long as the word China is somewhere in the question. So don't feel that you have to be constrained to just picking up on the themes that I've laid out. Feel free to ask whatever you want to ask. I'll count on Phil Potter to screen out all the tough ones and forward the rest to me. Uh, if you want to think about the Obama administration's policy toward China in the coming four years, I think you have to put it in the framework of what, to my mind, was probably the single biggest strategic decision that President Obama made in his first four years. And that decision was to rebalance toward Asia, or pivot toward Asia, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is a uh, decision that was region-wide. Uh, it is often talked about, both in the region and in the U.S. media, as all about China and directed at China. And I would argue both of those characterizations are wrong. I have some idea of what the president was thinking and what the White House National Security Council was thinking as they shaped this policy and have sought to implement it. And the policy truly is based on the president's uh, uh, appreciation that was already evident in what he said in the 2008 campaign, that the most important region for the United States over the long-term future is Asia. It's the world's fastest-growing region. 
It's the world's most populous region. It's the region with the major militaries of the world. Uh, and it's a region in which the U.S. has played a huge role for a very long time. Uh, we do most of our trade with Asia. I believe we have most of our investment in Asia. We have PACOM, our Pacific Command, is by far our largest military command globally. And yet we have spent 10 years enmeshed in two wars in the Middle East. Uh, without commenting on whether we should have been in those wars or should not be in those wars, the president felt that during his first term, he had to transition from the enormous investment of resources, not only treasure and lives, but also what's very precious in any government, the time of the top leaders of the government, had to transition from this enormous investment in the Middle East to a more <laughs> balanced policy that allowed for greater systematic and laying the basis for long-term and uh, high-impact uh, engagement with Asia. Uh, what are the purposes, you know, what are the goals of this? What I find in the discussion of this policy that is so uh, disappointing is that the tools that we're using are discussed endlessly and the goals are never mentioned. Uh, but, you know, tools are only important insofar as they get you closer to what the goals are that you're trying to achieve. Uh, I would sum up the goals of the rebalancing strategy uh, twofold. One is to encourage Asia's ongoing economic dynamism so that it continues to be a global driver of growth where the U.S. participates fully in that growth and benefits from it. Secondly, on the security side, to try to shape an environment there such that security issues do not end up disrupting that economic dynamism, basically having the region underperform because of tensions between countries and conflict potentially between countries in the region, and also a security environment such that the U.S. does not have to put unsustainable levels of resources into security issues in Asia, devoting both our treasury and putting at risk lives of Americans out there. So the idea is to uh, do what we can to develop a security environment where you have the kind of stability necessary to permit flourishing growth and to have us very much engaged on both parts of that effort. The former part being more of a cost but it's to get the benefit of the latter part, which is potentially enormously enriching in the broadest sense of the word as well as more narrowly. And the objective of diplomacy is to facilitate both of those outcomes, right? So this ends up being across the board. It's economic, it's security, and it's diplomatic. And it is region-wide. It is not only focused on China. Now, the major components of that, let me just spend a minute on, and then I'll turn, uh, now bring China more centrally into the equation. But the major components of it uh, include the following. On the economic side, uh, what's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. If you haven't heard of it, it's because it doesn't exist. Uh, it is being negotiated. Uh, but this is a trade and investment platform that we hope someday will be a platform for all of the major economies of Asia. Uh, we are now negotiating with a subset of those economies. Japan is trying to decide whether it can engage in this. South Korea would qualify for it. Uh, their free trade agreement with the United States that was finally ratified by both sides about a year ago uh, meets all the conditions that we're hoping to get into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The problem is their domestic politics won't let them sign on to this at this point, but hopefully that'll change. Uh, China is not a participant in this. It's not a participant largely because uh, its economy falls, it is managed in a way that so, is so far away from the kinds of standards that we're trying to build into this platform that we don't see a way at this point for China to get from where they are to meeting the conditions that we think will apply to this platform when those conditions are finalized, we hope, during 2013. Okay? 
but eventually we would like to have China join. It would be a tremendous success if you have a high quality trading investment platform and China does qualify, it means the Chinese economy has evolved in directions that really are very good for a global market economy. So that would be a tremendous success if it were to occur. Uh, so there are big issues there. The first issue is to finalize the negotiations among the current countries that are negotiating this, and then secondly, to try to expand it to get the really big players uh, all be a part of this. Secondly, on the diplomatic side, there are, for those of you who look at Asia, there are just a, an alphabet soup of multilateral organizations uh, in different parts of Asia in different groupings. Uh, one of the things the Obama administration really devoted a lot of attention to when I came into office was trying to figure out uh, where we'll put our resources uh, in that alphabet soup of uh, multilateral organizations. And the most important decision they made was uh, on the economic side, now it's developing TPP, it all along has also been involved in uh, APEC and ASEAN, which have economic dimensions to them. Right. On the security side, there's been no effective multilateral organization in Asia. Uh, what has developed is an organization called the East Asia Summit that the U.S. had decided not to join. Uh, the Obama administration decided that it would join it. It had to take some serious steps to qualify to join it. Uh, and they see that as the most important multilateral vehicle for addressing security issues in the region. Uh, let me add... A year before we formally joined, we discussed it with Beijing, and Beijing encouraged us to join. I think they may now be rethinking that enthusiasm, but uh, uh, we have joined. That requires that President Obama make an additional trip to Asia every year. And uh, for people like Susan who know something about presidential scheduling, uh, getting the president to commit to an additional trip out to Asia each year is, uh, was quite an accomplishment. Thirdly, on the military side, what does rebalancing mean? Uh, there is a lot of perception uh, uh, globally uh, that rebalancing means that we're going to withdraw from Europe and enormously boost our military resources in Asia. That is not what it means. Uh, what it me I mean, we are going to draw down in Europe. Uh, we have to draw down in various parts of the world, and Europe will bear part of that brunt. In Asia, what rebalancing means is we're not going to draw down in Asia. It doesn't mean we're going to plus up in Asia. It just means the Asian part of our military budget is being protected. Uh, the next president obviously can choose to change that. Uh, but in a time of budgetary constraint, uh, Asia, the Asia-Pacific region, basically PACOM, Pacific Command, uh, has its budget protected. There will be some modest shifting of resources that were pulled out of Asia for our wars in the Middle East to return to Asia as we fully extricate ourselves from those wars. But this is frankly around the margins. It is not uh, very dramatic. Uh, what is more consequential is that we are developing some new military doctrines. Uh, these are not spoken of as China's specific but they sure do fit the China challenge. Uh, the most uh, wide-ranging one is called the air-sea battle concept. Uh, this is fundamentally to get our Navy and our Air Force to actually work together so that uh, you know, Air Force planes can actually take data from naval radars and use it real time or vice versa. Uh, in a lot of ways, we can integrate assets uh, which otherwise don't talk to each other. Uh, in operational terms. Uh, so it's to optimize our naval and air capabilities. And in Asia, it's all about naval and air. You know, Army doesn't have much of a role there. Uh, so we can integrate those capabilities in order to maximize what we're able to do uh, given the resources we have available. Uh, this is focused on what's called overcoming an area denial so called A2AA. Um, oh, anti access area denial problem, which is to say, as coastal states, uh, especially Iran and China, frankly, uh, developed increased capabilities to keep our key assets, naval assets, farther from their shores. Question is, how do we overcome those increased capabilities so that we can operate relatively freely? outside of their territorial waters, 
but otherwise right up to the edge of their territorial waters. And so the question is, how do you overcome the combination of missiles and uh, submarines and other capabilities that can increasingly be brought to bear that otherwise might push you farther out to sea as you try to exert your power? So there are military, economic, and diplomatic uh, dimensions to what this strategy is about. Now the question is to what extent this is a China strategy, right? The Chinese see it as all about China uh, and all about constraining China's rise, complicating China's relations in the neighborhood, building the capacity to offset uh, China's growing abilities uh, and thereby uh, undermine China's interests. Um, This strategy builds China into the, middle of, <clears throat> into the middle of the strategy, but it's in the middle of the strategy because China is in the middle of Asia, uh, not only geographically, but in every other way. It is central to Asia. So you can't have an Asian strategy that doesn't have a huge China component to it because there's a huge China component to everything else you want to do in Asia. Uh, I think it's very hard to look at the record of the Obama administration and conclude that we have not sought to engage China on a massive scale. We have more cabinet level officials go to China in any six month period than to any other country in the world. We have more dialogues with China than with any other country in the world. We have more day to day contact than with any other country in the world. The State Department is now behind a major initiative to get 100,000 American students studying in China. And we welcome more students from China to the United States, I believe, than from any other country in the world. Uh, you know, this is not your, you know, your grandfather's containment strategy. Uh, this is very much a strategy of engagement in order to try to have a successful China play a constructive role globally. And constructive is not narrowly defined. It's, you know, in the broadest sense, contribute uh, to global well-being. Uh, as we think about China in the context of an Asian strategy, we have to keep in mind a couple of bedrock truths. Truth number one, <clears throat> is that China's economic role in Asia now dwarfs America's economic role in Asia. Okay? Even a country like South Korea, which is a U.S., long-standing U.S. ally, very close economic and other ties. Uh, South Korea does more trade with China than it does with the United States and Japan combined. Every country in Asia does more trade with China than it does with the United States. Um, in 2000, Virtually every country in Asia did more trade with the United States than it does with China. Uh, the gap between China's economic impact in Asia and America's is growing, not shrinking. And nothing that we do is going to change that fundamental reality. Okay, their lead is so large. And every country in the region, as it looks to the future, counts on being able to benefit from China's economic growth, to participate in it, and to benefit from it. And nothing's going to change that. Uh, what no country in the region wants, though, is for China to be able to leverage that economic position for diplomatic and security advantage. And uh, what they fear uh, is that China increasingly is seeking to do that. And there's a good case to be made for that. Yeah. So what's happened is that countries in the region have increasingly turned to the United States to provide the diplomatic and military leverage to limit China's ability to leverage its economic dominance for a diplomatic and security advantage, right? So we find that almost without exception, I mean, there are a couple of exceptions, Cambodia, Laos, but you know, otherwise pretty much across the region, every single country comes to the United States and says, you have to show up more. We need your military to play a larger role. We need you there in every multilateral meeting in Asia. You have to be engaged across the board because we're scared. Right? Now, back in 2009, the first year of the Obama administration, there were two worries. The biggest worry was of what was called a G2, the possibility that the US and China, remember this was in the context of the, of the global financial crisis, uh, President Obama came in, wanted a major stimulus program. The Chinese adopted a major stimulus program. Europe did not want to do that. So, you know, the U.S. and China worked very closely together, and a fear began to grow that the U.S. and China would work so closely together that they would effectively dictate to other countries what they could and could not do. 
If the U.S. and China were tightly in a tight embrace, no one could really stand up to them effectively. Right? Uh, no one worries about that anymore. That worry is gone. Right? It's been replaced by what was a residual worry and is now a central worry. And that worry is that the U.S.-China relationship will become uh, so difficult, so tense, eventually so antagonistic, that countries in the region effectively will have to choose to side with one side or the other. And no one wants to do that. So what we hear constantly in the region now is manage the relationship with China wisely. Wisely means do just enough that they can't bully us. But don't do so much that we have to choose between you and them. And thank you for figuring that out. <laughs> you know, uh, so that getting to the right, and this is very serious. I mean, it's very, you really hear this nonstop. China has really alarmed almost every country in the region. Right? So getting to the right place in the rebalancing strategy, even in the best of circumstances, is not going to be either easy or certain. This requires a lot of different activities and different dimensions that manage to get to a kind of ill-defined sweet spot that doesn't generate excessive antagonism, but does show strength and staying power. Uh, these uncertainties are increased, I think, by another factor that lurks behind both China and the United States here. Uh, there, uh, one of the big questions in Asia is whether, okay, the U.S. has announced we're rebalancing toward Asia, pivoting toward Asia. We have stepped up our game out, out there quite a bit, uh, diplomatically, dramatically, militarily in minor but very symbolically important ways. Uh, and we've declared that we aren't leaving. You know, this is really where we're putting a stake in the ground. And the question for countries in the region is, can we pull it off? Do we have staying power? And the biggest concern there is the U.S. Congress, is the fact that our political dysfunction is so dramatic that they fear that we may be slipping into uh, irreversible decline. Right? I think the biggest single loss of power for the United States in recent years was the uh, cliffhanger over increasing the debt ceiling in the United States a year and a half ago, during the summer of 2011. Around the region, I happen to be traveling around there quite a bit then, around the region it was unbelievable. People just looked at this and said, these guys are gone. I mean, if you can't reach a decision as simple as whether you will cover your debt when you're the world's reserve currency and the biggest debtor in the world, holy Toledo, you're gone, right? I mean, it just had a profound impact, and we're at it again, right? And we could say until the last election, the election this November, well, you know, in the U.S., the way we resolve political dysfunction is through elections, you know, and then to get the new people in, they've got momentum and they begin to put it together. Next couple of years are going to say a lot, right? And everybody's watching. So they wish us well, but really worry about whether we're shooting ourselves in the foot so badly that we're not a good bet for the long-term future, right? And the shadow of the future looms large. Now here, let me say, there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting dimension to this that doesn't get nearly enough attention. And that is that from a kind of 60,000 foot level, China is in the same position. It's just not, not as widely appreciated. Because in both China and the United States, uh, we are both acutely aware of the reality that what we've been doing in recent decades that has produced enormous success is not viable for the future. That we have to undertake significant reform, or it's not that our economies will collapse tomorrow, but over the course of the coming decade, without major reform, our futures are going to be dramatically and adversely affected. Now in the U.S., we currently have 70 plus percent of our GDP uh, is debt. That's very manageable. I mean, if we could assure it never got above that, we could all relax, okay? 
The problem is if you look at the cost and revenue curves and track them out to 2020, if we haven't made major changes in those curves, by 2020, we will have dug ourselves a hole. We will be so deeply in debt, forgive me mixing my metaphors, uh, that it will dramatically ad adversely affect our future beyond that. Right? What's the problem? It's not that we don't understand it. We do. It's not that we don't know what we have to do. In broad terms, we do. We have to increase revenues and decrease expenditures, or at least as, a, as versus current expectations. Right? Our problem has been very simple. We don't have the political wherewithal to make the tough decisions. Right? That's what you see every day. Right? China has the same problem. Uh, the development model that they have followed for the last two decades, which has been so phenomenally successful, has now run its course. The basic assumptions behind that model, and I'll detail this if anyone wants to ask questions about it, but let me just say the basic assumptions behind the model are no longer valid. Uh, they have, in typical Chinese fashion, very pragmatically laid out a new development model and adopted it as, at least in theory, their national policy. The problem is they have, to date, demonstrated an incapacity, a failure of political capacity, to actually implement those decisions. Uh, their current model will continue to generate a fair amount of growth but that growth is already increasingly socially and politically destabilizing rather than stabilizing, uh, increasingly unsustainable in terms of resource use uh, and in terms of what the cost of labor will be and that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, if they are still there 10 years from now, we'll likely lock them into some form of middle income trap where they will not rise to be a high income middle-class country, and they know it. But what they have to do to address that is much more complicated than what we have to do to address our problem, and much more pl difficult politically. They have a new leadership that's just come in. We'll have to see how they do. But the bottom line is, at the end of the day, probably the most fundamental determinant of our relationship with China 10 years from now will be how far each of us respectively has gotten in undertaking not only adopting, but implementing the reforms that each of us has to take to be successful domestically. That's what generates capability. On the U.S. side, everyone's very sensitive to that and looks ahead with that in mind. On the Chinese side, there's still this kind of peculiar division. You talk to people who study China, and they all know what I just said about China's domestic situation. right? You talk to people about China's role in the world, and they all forget what I just said about China's domestic situation and assume that China's going to keep on growing, if not at 10 percent, then at 8 percent or 7.5 percent, plenty enough to be a dramatically more powerful place 10 years from now. Right? Uh, so this hasn't quite gotten there yet. But if China doesn't undertake major reforms, this reality is going to be increasingly pressing and we'll begin to factor in in a major way to international calculations. Now, let me say rebalancing this broad strategy has achieved notable results. Uh, I think it's the greater U.S. energy behind its role in the region, which in part is simply our ability to conceptualize what we're doing, to package it, if you will, and sell it, and then show up you know, with, a, with a kind of dynamism and a program behind us, has really increased our credibility. Uh, there's a sense, again, of the U.S. being robust after the year 2009, 2010, at the height of the financial crisis, and as we just began to come out of it, where it looked like we were really set back on our heels and uh, uh, slipping into decline. Uh, there is, as I've stressed, a real desire by many to increase the U.S. role. And frankly, if you're in the White House, it feels pretty good to have countries in the region asking you to do more, right? And they really love you and want you. It, that's reinforcing. I mean, people are people. That is affirmative. It's reinforcing. Uh, with the, with the kind of kicker being the question about our staying power. Uh, my problem with what's happened since we announced the rebalancing strategy is that these immediate wins that I've just described are potentially increasing the risk 
of failing to achieve the strategic goals of the policy that I named earlier on the economic and security sides. And so I think we need to start to rebalance our rebalancing strategy to make midterm adjustments uh, in it. Uh, over the last couple of years, territorial disputes, especially maritime territorial disputes in the region have become much sharper. And the risk of actual conflict, especially between China and Japan, has gone up a great deal. I think conflict, if it occurs, will be not because one side decided to shoot at the other. It's because there will be some accident or incident that causes loss of life, and neither side can control the escalation uh, very effectively. And a huge amount of damage can be done uh, very rapidly. Again, if you want to ask, I'll, I'll lay that out. Uh, also, uh, the way this has played out, again, I stress the conceptualization of this from the start has been region-wide, build bridges to China, integrate China into a region that has plenty of room for both of us and where we can do a lot of things together. The way it's played out in China is this is all about China and it's all against China. And the Chinese have a real kind of conspiratorial understanding of U.S. motives. The premise of that is that the U.S., First of all, the U.S. has always been anti-communist, pro-democracy. Uh, we voice that sentiment whenever we get an opportunity to. It's who we are, right? But if you're a leader of the Chinese Communist Party, that translates into the U.S. seeks to overthrow you. You know, that gets personal, right? <laughs> and that is not welcome. So there's an underlying distrust about whether ultimately we see our success as premised on uh, system change in China. I think, in fact, we don't. We just, you know, we can't say we don't because we're pro-democracy. But we don't say we do. You never see the president call for the overthrow of the Chinese Communist Party or something like that. It's kind of two tracks in our foreign policy. But they put them together very seriously. But more specifically, they assume that because the U.S. is the most powerful country in the world and because they are now the second most powerful country in the world, and because their power trajectory is going up, while well, they see ours as having plateaued and at some point will start to go down. Some think it started and others think it will start at some point in the not too distant future. That we must be using our phenomenal global power to uh, delay, uh, constrain, complicate, and if we can possibly do it, disrupt China's rise. So that everything they see around the region, from democratic reform in Burma uh, to how the Philippines acts uh, when there's a dust up over fishing vessels in a shoal near the Philippines in, in disputed area, to anything else you can name, uh, is all at the instigation of the United States. The problem, and if you point out to them the many, many, many things we've done, including in the Obama administration, that are in China's interests, you know, the people who are being honest with you sit there and say, yes, that just shows how clever you are. <laughs> right? I mean, the problem with the, with the conspiracy theory is there's no way to disprove a conspiracy theory. Right? Because if you're smart enough, you'll occasionally mislead him by doing something nice. Right? But ultimately, that creates enormous distrust. Distrust about long-term intentions and the the motivation behind everything you do. Uh, now, the Chinese don't want an antagonistic relationship with the United States. We're the biggest single issue out there for them. Right? We don't want an antagonistic relationship with China. But when we see them adopt that analytical approach, uh, it encourages many on the US side to say, well, if that's the way they think, then they must be concluding that the only way they can really meet their aspirations is by undermining the United States. If they think we're using our power to constrain them, then unless they're idiots, they'll feel they have to do what they can to undermine our power in order to give them the space that is rightfully theirs. And if that's what they're going to do, then maybe we better be a little more serious about defending against that. Right? And so you can see how you can easily get into a negative spiral here, uh, even if that is not the uh, desire of either side. Uh, in addition, when you think about it, 
as I've stressed, China's economic role in the region has continued to grow, right? For China, Asia is a huge profit center. Our security region, uh, role in the region is growing. Security is a huge cost center. Given our budgetary constraints, we, do, we should not want to end up in a place where for China, Asia is a profit center, and for us, it's a growing cost center. All right? We want Asia to be a profit center for China and us and many others uh, with minimal but necessary security commitments to make that occur. But the trends of the last couple of years are not there. They're moving somewhat and increasingly in the other direction. Uh, in addition to that, uh, given the realities of the way the world works, uh, the Department of Defense now has fully taken on board that they, the coming decade in budgetary terms will not look like the last decade in budgetary terms. They've had a tremendously rich budgetary environment for the past decade, and a little more than that. Uh, that is now coming to a screeching halt. And the issue is who loses what from their, from their wish lists and from their necessary, I, I don't want to sound sarcastic, I mean, who loses what is now a constrained budgetary environment. Uh, those who study the military know full well that one of the ways you protect a budget in the military is you articulate more clearly and compellingly than any other competitor for that money the threat that you alone can deal with effectively, if only you're given the appropriate resources. Now, the biggest money in the military, other than for personnel, is for major new weapon systems. Right? Research, development, testing, evaluation, deployment, and operation. It's the biggest budget in the history of the world, other than our personnel budget. Right? So that's a lot of money at stake. There is only one country out there where dealing with them if they become really antagonistic requires major new weapon systems, and that's China. You don't need them for terrorism. You, know, you don't need them for Kuwait. Right? You don't need them for Luxembourg. You need them for China. So there's a natural tendency, not cynical, well-intentioned, to articulate the downside, the downside potential of China, and what would be necessary to protect our vital interests if that downside potential becomes a reality. And in the world of new weapon systems, you're always living in the 15-year future. That's your time horizon. From the time when there is an initial uh, conceptualization enough that it becomes a real policy issue whether to go in that direction or not, to actual deployment of, of major weapon systems, it's generally 15 years. Depends on the system. Some are much longer, few are shorter. But you're a futurologist. And since no one really knows what the future will hold, the question is where you place your bets and what's the most compelling place to put scarce resources. And China is emerging increasingly in those debates. Right? And there is huge, huge money involved. Let me say, by the way, I'm quite convinced on the Chinese side, same thing is true. The US drives the debate there. Right? Taiwan doesn't warrant the budgetary expenditures that dealing with the US Navy uh, warrants. Right? So you have this kind of our hardliners and their hardliners are the best of friends. So I think it's time to think about what we can do to get things on a better trajectory within this overall strategy. And let me suggest uh, an approach to doing this. Uh, we have to continue convincingly to tell our friends and allies in the region that we are there for them, we're there for the long term, and we're going to have their back. Okay. Uh, should keep in mind, though, that if we can affect Chinese behavior in a way that reduces, that makes Chinese behavior in their minds more responsible, less threatening, uh, we get credit for that. That is what you call wise management of the relationship with China. So I think while providing ongoing strong assurances to friends and allies, uh, we need to do some things to kind of bring Beijing back into the equation on a more positive basis. The question is, how can you do that? Keep in mind, there's a new Chinese leadership. Uh, uh, no 
person becomes a leader of China by working on foreign affairs. Right? This is a deeply, deeply indigenous, domestic-oriented political system. Uh, you know, our Secretary of State is the top-ranking cabinet officer in the United States. In China, you look at the top 25 officials and not a single one of them is charged with managing foreign affairs. Right? Their foreign minister is so far down in the pecking order, it gets lost in the crowd. Right? Uh, a guy like Xi Jinping has very, very little foreign exposure. Uh, the only member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo who was educated abroad graduated from Kim Il-sung University in Pyongyang. <laughs> right? So, I mean, you just have to keep that in mind. Right? We deal with China you know, as an international actor. China is all about internal stuff, and foreign policy derives from internal dynamics. Okay? Uh, have a new leader there who faces enormous demands for domestic reform has a plate absolutely full. And 70% of China's party, government, and military leadership is turning over in a six-month period. 70%. So there's a lot that is just very unclear about what decisions will be made and where these guys will head. Seems to me we ought to take advantage of that uh, uh, period of uncertainty about what operational priorities will be to lay out for them quietly, not publicly. Uh, and the details would be decided within the US government. So any things I suggest are just my own thoughts, right? So uh, if I really thought they were going to do what I suggest, I wouldn't be suggesting it publicly, right? Uh, <laughs> but conceptually, to lay out for them a program, a set of issues that meet several criteria. One, they are issues of concern to China. In many cases, they are issues that affect China's views of our ultimate intentions. And they are issues that the president can act on without the support of the US Congress, since it's not clear that he can get that support for anything he wants to uh, do. Uh, and finally, there are issues that, that stretch across political, economic, and military arenas. So I'm going to go across the relationship. Uh, and uh, indicate what he is prepared to do on those issues. Uh, I, I'm running short of time, so I'm not going to go through a lot of suggestions as to what they may be, but just to ask the question, I'll take up the rest of the time on them, because it's easy to come up with a substantial list of significant issues that the president can execute on, where, let me say, all of them are in our interest to do. So this is not giving up major U.S. interests as a sign of goodwill toward China. This is acting on American interests, but also doing so as part of a package that demonstrates to the Chinese side that we take this relationship extremely seriously, we value it, and we're prepared to move forward on it in a wide-ranging way. We should present that to the Chinese leadership quietly and say to them, you know what our areas of concern are. Come up with your list that is comparable. Comparable in significance, comparable in impact. Don't make it public. We don't want to get a document out of this. Right? Come back with us, to us with your list and let's sit down and negotiate. And see whether we can reach a package of steps that each of us will take within prescribed periods of time and where expectations are reasonably clear. We're taking those steps will build mutual confidence that both of us take this seriously and that we want to have a more stable, forward-looking, expanding relationship that is in both of our interests. And again, I'll suggest specifics if you want to raise them. This sounds abstract, but it's actually the only reason I don't want to go into specifics is that they're so dull. Right? I mean, you know, it's a lot of detailed programs, you know, uh, you know, wrapping up our technology export review program, you know, this kind of stuff. You know, it's a lot of stuff, but these things are all very significant in the relationship. Uh, the nice side about this is if we can put together a package like this, first of all, you have to do it internally in the U.S. by an interagency process that will get buy-in from the various parts of the U.S. government. And so the objective is to get each of the major players, DOD and state and Treasury, et cetera, feeling like they own the program, right? And the White House runs the process, but it, it, in a new administration, almost everyone who deals seriously with China at a policy level is changing in a four-month period here. 
right? So it's a new team. You got to construct a new consensus, and this is a great vehicle for doing that, right? Uh, secondly, if you offer it to China and the Chinese can't step up and offer something comparable, A, you don't have to implement anything, and B, you get credit for having offered it. Right? You've shown your goodwill, and you've also shown your tough. I'm not going to do that if you aren't going to do something comparable. Right? So there's not a downside uh, to doing this. Thirdly, why should we offer it instead of just asking the Chinese to come to the table with their wide-ranging set of initiatives? Because the Chinese are incapable of developing a wide-ranging set of initiatives. Their bureaucratic system simply is incapable of doing that. When you want to get anything that is uh, that has some scope and uh, some uh, drama to it done with China. It is always the case that you have to propose it. That then gives their bureaucracies something to come together to discuss and respond to. And then their response may be quite creative, right? They aren't bashful about responding. They can't take the first step, right? But I would argue even that's in our interest because it has a great advantage of letting us set the terms of the discussion, right? And then they respond. That's actually not a bad position to be in when you're in a negotiation. Uh, so, uh, and I think that Xi Jinping personally is very early in his thinking about international strategy uh, and about the balance, how he wants to play the interface of the international and domestic uh, policy arenas in China. I think he still is, you know, when you're number two in China, you don't get to make those decisions. It's only when you step up to number one, right? And so he's in a really new, new situation. Uh, and that's the right time to get to him. Not quite yet, but this summer or early this fall. Now, none of this would be easy, but I think recent trends and new opportunities suggest that it's both timely uh, and necessary. Um, I am out of time. The other thing I was going to do is to tell you the four reasons why this will not work. But I'll wait <laughs> to get your questions uh, instead of doing that. So I, I have periodically said, ask about this if you want me to follow up on it, and ask about anything else as long as China is somewhere in the question. We have reached that point. But I really do look forward to your questions and happy to respond to whatever you want to raise. OK? Thank you very much. Dr. Lieberthal, my name is Christina. I'm a second year Master of Public Policy student here at the Ford School. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you on behalf of the students for coming to speak to us today. Um, the first question we have here is, in response to the latest North Korean nu nuclear test, how can the US further pressure the Chinese to rein in North Korea? Okay. Are there any specific policy ideas be uh, beyond dialogue? And what is stopping China from taking action? We break at what time? <laughs> uh, you know, if you read what has been said in the last day and a half or so since North Korea had its most recent nuclear test, there are a series of themes here. Can you all hear me? Is, is this microphone? No? OK, let me. If you read what's been said in the last day and a half or so since the most recent North Korean nuclear test, I mean, a series of consistent themes, most of which I think are wrong, right? North Koreans are inscrutable. Right? So you don't know what they're going to do. Uh, I think the North Koreans are very predictable. You always know what they're going to do. The problem is it's exactly the opposite of what you want them to do. OK, but actually, you go back, and their strategy has been more consistent than the strategy of almost any country you can imagine. Right? Secondly, China has a lot of leverage over North Korea, but just won't use it. Uh, what constrains China is two things regarding North Korea. Uh, one is that it is very, very difficult for a big state to tell a little state what it should do and have it do it. Just think Cuba. Forget Cuba. Think Haiti. Right? We, haven't, you know, we have these itsy bitsy places <laughs> very near to America's southern border that have not lacked for US attention over the years. And we've never been able to get them to do what we want them to do. Right? Uh, so it sounds good, but it doesn't work. Uh, and in addition, China is constrained because while we don't fear instability in Cuba, China does fear instability in North Korea, big time. And what they fear is that what they will end up with is a unified nuclear Korean peninsula in bed with the United States. 
That's a terrible outcome from their perspective. So while they don't want a nuclear North Korea, a nuclear North Korea undermines Chinese interests everywhere. They even more don't want a unified pro-American nuclear armed Korean peninsula, which would be a major player, right? And so on balance, they try to nudge North Korea, but are constrained. Now, I think, in fact, there are some things that China can do. They aren't exactly what we've been calling on them to do. Uh, you know, we tend to focus on what we support in a UN resolution that will impose more sanctions on North Korea. Frankly, you know, we've run out of sanctions. We sanction everything in North Korea, right? And it doesn't make much difference because they don't do much with the international world, right? Uh, but I think there are some things that China can do and an approach they could take. And what I would quietly be going to them on is the following package. In the UN, support a resolution. They're going to do it anyway. You know, and well, you know, we won't be quite as harsh as we otherwise would have been because it's a distinction without a difference. Nothing's going to change what North Korea is doing anyway, right? Uh, so get the Chinese to sign up for the best they can and then praise them for doing it, right? But quietly say to them, we have two big asks. Right? One is the North Korean nuclear and missile program, my understanding is, are organically tied to the Iranian nuclear missile, I'm sorry, missile and nuclear programs. When North Korea tested its long-range missile, uh, the most recent test, the first one that was successful, the third stage was Iranian. Right? The two nuclear programs have been joined at the hip for years. So when North Korea tests a nuclear weapon, I don't know for sure, but I think there's a very good chance the data are going to Iran. So they don't have to test, right? That's a huge threat. My sense of geography is you can't fly from North Korea to Iran without landing in China, or at least crossing Chinese airspace, because no one else is going to let you go, right? So suppose we go to the Chinese and say, don't let any North Korean or Iranian planes fly from one country to the other across Chinese airspace. That would be a way to kill two birds with one stone. Right? Invisible. No one need notice. You don't have to make an announcement. But it would wake up leaders in both countries big time. And secondly, China should begin, they've done a little bit of this, they should do on a much larger scale, a delaying and disrupting uh, Chinese supplies to North Korea, right? Not joining sanctions, just things don't show up. Have a problem with the rail system, have some incident over here, sorry, the factory couldn't produce that, you'll just have to wait. Don't know when it'll come. North Korea will get the message in 24 hours. Right? And if they continue, you ratchet it up a little bit, something you can control completely, right? No one's face is involved. If you do it publicly, there's face involved. If you just do it, then it's real money and you get attention. So that's what I would go to the Chinese for. And the third thing I would do is see whether the Xi administration, different from Hu Jintao, who was a wuss on this stuff, frankly. Don't quote me on that. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, but see whether the Xi administration is willing to sit down with us and with South Korea to talk about what we do if there is a dramatic contingency in North Korea, okay? Not that we have to act together, but we should know what each other are thinking about, what our plans are. What it, for example, currently, if there were a real collapse in North Korea, which is unlikely but feasible, certainly over the coming 10 years, it's feasible, right? Uh, if there were a real collapse, you can be sure the PLA has contingencies to move into the northern part of the country. Uh, to pacify it, potentially to try to identify where nuclear materials are and, you know, get a hold of them, uh, and to prevent massive refugee flows into China, right? Well, guess what? The U.S. and South Korea have similar plans, right? It would not be at all surprising to learn that there are parts of Korea where both militaries would have operational orders to seize it and hold it and pacify the population. If we aren't talking to each other, we could end up shooting at each other, which is not an outcome anyone would want to have. But we literally don't talk about the issue. We have never had a conversation with China about long-term contingencies in North Korea. Never. 
Okay, now let me say we've been willing to and they have not. Question is whether under new circumstances with new leadership, they might be more willing to and we ought to see what we can do to foster that conversation. So that'd be my set of issues. The next question is, what are the implications of China's aging population for China's rise? Uh, China, uh, let me give you one ratio, uh, one set of ratios, just to highlight what the issue is here. Currently in China, uh, you have one retired person for every five people of working age. I'm sorry, one dependent for every five people of working age, but those dependents overwhelmingly are retired, not children. Okay? Uh, by 2030, you will have uh, one dependent for every two people of working age. Between now and 2030, China's demographic pyramid, its age distribution becomes the same as Japan or Italy or Florida. <laughs> okay, I'm serious, you know. Uh, the, uh, for the first time uh, last year, China's uh, working age population shrank. Uh, that was only a marginal portion of 1%. That shrinkage will accelerate phenomenally uh, over the coming uh, 25 years, phenomenally. And you know it. I mean, one thing about age is, you, you know, you can tell the future, right? And the future is very, very grim on that. So they are going with unprecedented speed from being a country with a demographic surplus, which is to say, as compared with other countries at their level of GDP, having more people working age population than the normal one does, and fewer dependents. They, are they have enjoyed that for several decades. They are now transitioning at literally historically unprecedented speed to the opposite. Which are not quite the opposite, but, but you know, where they have a demographic deficit, fewer people working age uh, as a percentage of the population than almost any other country in their category of GDP or anticipated GDP. Uh, the, uh, that has consequences. Uh, the price of labor will go up. The ability to support double-digit increases in their military budget will be, there's going to be a lot more competition for those dollars. Uh, they have to improve health care. Uh, they have to improve all kinds of services for the elderly. Uh, we're talking about retirement of our baby boomers. It is not nearly as dramatic as the transition occurring in China. And so how they work that out is not fully clear at this point. Frankly, the politics are such that they still haven't dropped their one-child policy, which is frankly insane. But politics are a funny business, right? And they just haven't been able to do it. Uh, so you, know, you don't know for sure, but, but what you do know for sure is they can't continue the development strategy they've had to date. That has to undergo major changes. And that will require a lot of investment and a lot of very difficult policy decisions. And we'll just have to see how it works out. How can the US mediate between China and Japan without alienating China regarding the Diaoyu Islands? And also as it relates to the, the security issues in the South China Sea? Um, it was enough to say Diaoyu. You don't have to say South China Sea, too. I, mean, that's a, um, uh, I don't think we really can mediate. Okay, that's the bottom line. China and Japan have dealt with each other for a long time. Um, if what we can do is what we've done to date, which is to encourage them in every way we can to cool it. Right? And we say the same thing to both of them on that. Let me explain what the danger is here. I don't think that China and Japan are going to start shooting at each other as an act of conscious policy. Uh, both of them realize that if there's a real conflict, their economic relationship will tank, and that will have dramatically negative consequences for both of them. This is not like dealing with the Philippines in the Chinese economy. This is huge. Uh, and the Chinese are very sensitive to that. Uh, but they now have a situation around these islands called Diaoyu in Chinese and Senkaku by the Japanese. Uh, these are five uninhabitable rocks. You know, I mean, they literally are. You know. uh, so they're of no real significance in terms of being able to base, you know, put a naval base there or air base or something. I mean, just ridiculous, right? Uh, 
but they've been caught up in nationalist passions over sovereignty. Uh, the, uh, both countries are now putting a lot of boats in that area to uh, highlight that effectively they're the ones that control the area. Okay? What the Chinese say, we have traditionally said the Japanese administer this area. And the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty covers these rocks, not because we recognize Japanese sovereignty. We do not. But our security treaty, in a peculiar little anomaly, says it covers uh, all areas uh, of Japanese sovereignty and all areas administered by Japan. And these rocks have been administered by Japan. So an attack on Japanese forces over these rocks, in theory, could trigger U.S. response militarily. Right? Uh, that's why it's very hard for us to mediate, because we have an alliance that covers one side's participation in this. Right? Uh, the, the danger here is there are enough boats and enough planes increasingly kind of challenging each other just by their presence that there could well be an accident or incident that causes loss of life. And if that occurs, this will turn instantaneously into a wholly different problem. Because I think given the politics of each country, keep in mind, each is still in the middle of a political transition. Uh, in Japan, in July, there is a parliamentary election that is very important to the new Abe government. In China, next month, they have a National People's Congress that will form their government. Right? Uh, this is not a time when either side will be very good at, at escalation management. Right? So it is a big problem. And what the Chinese want is for the Japanese to at least recognize that there is a dispute over sovereignty. And the Japanese say, there is no dispute over sovereignty. We have sovereignty. Uh, now, there are ways diplomatically to bridge that. You can end up saying, we have indisputable sovereignty, but we know that there are some others who disagree with that position, even though our position is right. And it at least acknowledges a dispute. Right? I mean, you know, there are different things you could do. But I think what they have to do in a very, very urgent basis is to get, it's too early to have the governments really try to negotiate this. Too much face and too much passion out there right now. But get some of the elders in each, on each side who have known each other for many years, who trust each other, and who have command the respect of current leaders in each of their respective countries. Have them get together and work out not any final resolution, not capable of that, but work out steps that each can take unilaterally to pull back, to get these boats farther away from each other, to not have planes over there at the same time, uh, so that you reduce dramatically the chances of accident. Uh, and, and create the chronological space necessary to be able, maybe later this year, to begin to engage government to government to try to get some workable agreement, some language diplomatically and then some workable agreement on the ground, will not resolve sovereignty. You know, sovereignty is very hard to negotiate, but you can, but you can postpone sovereignty, each side claiming that they have indisputable sovereignty and work out on the ground uh, how things will operate. Uh, that's been done before. I think it needs to be done again. They need to get to it real fast. Uh, South China Sea is an even longer answer. Do you really want me to get into that? Or? No, okay. I'll, <laughs> thank you. Um, China is now the world's largest producer of solar and wind systems, yet it still relies on coal for 70% of its electricity generation. Mm -hmm. This has colossal impacts on both the environment and global climate change. How can this be dealt with? How can it be dealt with? Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, let me say China, th there's one statistic that's wrong there. It relies on coal for over 80% of its electricity generation for 70% of its total power, uh, total energy use. Uh, it relies so heavily on coal, A, because it's the most, if you don't price out the externalities of burning coal, in other words, if you assume uh, asthma treatment, uh, you know, all, all the things that happen, including global climate change, that happen are, should not figure into the price of coal, then coal is the cheapest source of energy by far. 
right? And China is a development country. Their energy demands are expanding at a phenomenal rate, and uh, so they grab coal. Also, coal is the only source of energy they have in relative abundance domestically. So there's an energy security dimension to this, too. Now, they, in fact, have bought into the need to transition uh, both uh, for energy, uh, both because of, uh, of, of environmental degradation uh, and because they are realizing now that they do not have as many years of coal use ahead of them as they thought they had. Uh, if you go back a little more than 10 years, the Chinese thought they had, the usual figure was 900 years of coal reserves, right? In any case, hundreds of years of coal reserves. That figure is now down to 40 and dropping like a rock, okay? Down to 40 for two reasons. One is their energy demand has just expanded much faster than they anticipated it would, so you need more coal. But secondly, to mine coal, you need water. And most of China's coal is in the North China Coal Basin where they have a dramatic water shortage. Uh, and what they're finding is their lack of water is now limiting their capacity to exploit coal in the North China Coal Basin. And they have now become, I think, the world's largest coal importer in the last five years. Right? So uh, they are trying to transition away from coal. That's the good news. The bad news is they have been trying in one way or another to transition away from coal for at least 15 years, uh, and they had totally failed. Uh, it's in part, again, because their overall energy demands have been growing so rapidly that even as they rapidly develop uh, solar, uh, some wind energy, they're going in for biofuels, uh, they're trying to develop natural gas, they're importing more oil and using more oil for uh, firing power plants. They're doing everything they can. I, the figure I've been told, I don't know whether it's accurate or not, is they spend about $9 billion a month on building non-coal energy sources. Right? Uh, and the result of all of that is that the percentage of energy that is that derives from coal is the same as it was before they started. Right? So they are in deep, deep trouble on this issue. And I think at the end of the day, uh, they aren't going to get away from coal uh, until they begin to really run out of it. Uh, so the focus really needs to be on more efficient exploitation of coal. Uh, you know, supercritical uh, combustion, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, you know, these kind of some of these things are well developed. Some, something like carbon capture and sequestration was in early days, but it's the kind of thing, those are the kinds of things that limit the externalities from use of coal. And I think that they just have to put a lot more money into that and focus on it much more effectively. And let me say, I think we have a role to play in a lot of this because we have a lot of, we're farther along in some of these technologies than they are, but they can scale them up faster than we can. So if we get together, we can do some things that actually would benefit both sides. The Chinese are doing a lot of development and resource extraction in Africa that, can, that run counter to U.S. interests. Can you speak a little bit about this uh, and about U.S. policy towards China and Africa? Are there specific policies that have uh, been developed to address the relationship in this context? If so, what are they? Um, China began to move into Africa in a major way really just in the last 15 years or so. They've had a presence before then, and certainly a political presence, but their investment presence is relatively recent and has scaled up very, very rapidly. Uh, our big concerns about it have been mostly that they really have uh, uh, not the kind of conditionality that we put on aid or that the World Bank puts on loans. This is environmental uh, our governance standards and things like that. They go in, they pay out, pay off everyone in town and get the resources they want. Right? Uh, the, uh, what they do contribute is they build a lot of infrastructure. And uh, that infrastructure has contributed in a significant way, I am told. I'm not an African specialist, so this is all just you know, what I'm told by people who look at this. Uh, that infrastructure has contributed in a significant way to the rapid growth of Africa's GDP over the last decade. So I'm not sure that I would look at this as solely what they're doing is not in America's interest. If it, 
enables Africa's economy to begin to really get on a sustainable development path. I'm not talking about sustainable, I don't mean strictly environmental, I mean get to a kind of takeoff and self-sustaining. Uh, I think that's a very, very good thing. What the Chinese are finding, uh, very painfully, is that a major reason why a lot of Western firms are not in Africa, or not in particular parts of Africa where the Chinese go, is because they're very high risk. And they're high risk for a reason. So the Chinese are now finding that they have problems of mine managers being beaten to death, uh, Chinese workers being kidnapped, uh, people being shot, uh, local governments, uh, you know, local political leaders campaigning against the rape of the land by the Chinese and kick the Chinese out, you know, this kind of stuff. You know, it's the kind of stuff you run into, right? And bribes don't always square the circle. So they have begun to become much leerier about continuing to ramp up the way they have been in Africa, and they're becoming more sophisticated about it. We and others are now talking with them in much more detail than we did before about uh, aid program cooperation, aid program standards, how you manage these things in a way that minimizes risk. Uh, keep in mind, for China and Africa, most of what they do in Africa is through their corporations. So it isn't government aid, it's corporate investment backed usually by loans from the China Development Bank, you know, from one of their policy banks or something like that. So there's government money behind it, but the purpose is profit, right? And there may be some strategic element to it. Certainly these companies are encouraged to go out and bring resources in because China is a tremendously resource scarce society in terms of natural resources. Um, but the companies don't want to go where they're going to lose money and get their people killed. So we're finding after this initial rush, there is now some rethinking, and I wouldn't be surprised if within a decade we have a somewhat, you know, a, a clearly uh, adjusted approach by China in Africa. Uh, and I think this will be the last question. What do you foresee as the biggest challenge in U.S.-China relationship in the next five years? And what advice do you have for China and the U.S. government separately to create a win-win situation? Hmm. The, uh, the biggest danger I see, I think, because I think we're in a fairly critical period. After all, we have a new leadership in China that, at least for the top couple of people, will be there for 10 years. And we have a second administration, you know, second term Obama administration in for another four years. Uh, my biggest concern is that five years from now, uh, we'll be at a point where it is hard to avoid slipping into a fundamentally antagonistic relationship, which I think would be a huge loss for both sides and for everyone else in Asia. Uh, I mean, some of us in this room lived through the Cold War. It costs a lot. Costs in opportunity, costs in quality of life, costs in wealth, costs in lives. Yeah? Not a good place to end up. Uh, we can get there in a lot of ways. First of all, there's this underlying distrust of intentions. There are the dynamics within each of our military establishments. And I will say our bilateral relationship is wide-ranging and deep in terms of activities and stuff, except between our militaries. Our militaries interact at about the level that the rest of our governments interacted at 20 years ago. I mean, literally about two decades behind the rest. And that's not good. Thirdly, there's a tail wags the dog problem. I mean, you asked about the Diaoyu Islands earlier, right? We could get drawn into conflict that we have no interest in whatsoever. I mean, frankly, it is totally irrelevant to us who has administrative control over the Diaoyu Islands. I actually talked with Henry Kissinger about this because he was the guy that made the decision to put the Diaoyu Islands under Japanese administration. Uh, and the records are there. I mean, the meeting where he made it. Uh, and the discussion of it and everything. I asked him about it, I said, you know, frankly, you're not the first person who's asked me, and for the life of me, I can't remember it. <laughs> you know, and I, he wasn't being disingenuous. I mean, this is so inconsequential. So was the start of World War I. Right? I mean, you know, you get just obligations that get you into a particular situation that has a dynamic that you can't quite control because of nationalist passions elsewhere, 
and then credibility becomes an issue and do you stand up for your alliance and this kind of thing. You know, don't get me wrong, I'm not anticipating a third world war, but uh, <coughs> both sides can want to have a good relationship and there are a lot of paths to end up some, someplace very different. So that's my biggest concern, frankly, that five years from now it will be much harder to steer it back onto a more stable and positive forward trajectory. It's one of the main reasons why um, suggesting what I just suggested in the formal remarks I made, which is that we need to try to come up with a package of things that in their totality communicate an intention to credibly have a much better relationship. So some of the things, like I mentioned in passing, completing a technology export review. This review has been going on for three and a half years in the U.S. government. Our, currently our current technology export policy hurts American business dramatically. We preclude our businesses from exporting many things that our West European uh, allies export without question. So we lose the business and they get the business. Right? This isn't only to China, this is a global, you know, global regime. We've been reviewing it for three and a half years to rationalize it and bring it up to date. We have not gotten the review done. The Chinese see it as directed at them. They complain constantly that we restrict technology exports to them where they can get the technology elsewhere. It shows that we want to constrain their development. Well, you know, it doesn't show that at all, but you can understand why they think it. Let's put that on the table and let's get the president behind concluding that technology export review. Let's offer to them, let me give you three other things just, just to, you know, give you a couple of uh, a flavor for what we can do, right? The uh, President Obama met with Hu Jintao 12 times uh, over the last four years. Uh, with only a couple, literally a couple of exceptions, every one of those meetings was on the side of some multilateral meeting that they were both participating in. The APEC leaders meeting or the G20 or you know, whatever. Uh, one time Hu Jintao came to the UN General Assembly uh, opening uh, and they had a one hour bilat. You know, one-hour bilateral meeting, which is the standard uh, venue, right? Now, keep in mind, who speaks no English? Obama speaks no Chinese. The interpretation is consecutive, not simultaneous. So each gets to speak for 15 minutes in a one-hour meeting. Uh, and who, in particular, always just sat there and read his talking points. So there was no interaction. You know, literally none. Right? Uh, Xi Jinping is more flexible than Hu Jintao is. Frankly, anyone breathing is more flexible. But that's a, you know. uh, the, uh, I think Obama ought to offer to Xi Jinping that when we meet on the side of these multilateral meetings, we will take three hours together. And it will include an informal meal. All right? And so we have a chance to talk, get a chance to know each other. Because if we're going to engage, it's got to be driven by the top of each government. You need, the, you need the very top leaders mutually invested and build some mutual trust. Secondly, we now conduct more than 60 bilateral government-to-government -government dialogues with China every year. Uh, it's an alphabet soup of dialogues across each of our governments. Uh, there is one common characteristic of every single one of those dialogues. Not one of them talks about the long-term future, ever. Okay? Every one, single one of them is about a current problem in the next couple of months until you have the next dialogue. Right? But our fundamental distrust is about the long-term future. So I would recommend we establish a what's called a Paul Mill dialogue, one that gets civilians and uniformed officers in the room, where the focus of the dialogue is our respective strategic postures in Asia five to ten years from now. What are the doctrines? What are the platforms? What, is, what are the red lines? Are there areas where mutual restraint might actually build mutual confidence and build greater security for both sides? We could actually have those discussions with the Russians over nuclear weapons. We can't have them with the Chinese. It's just bizarre, right? And by the way, we have never sought to have them with the Chinese, and they've never sought to have them with us. I think we ought to take the initiative and see if we can develop that and do it at a high level, have it meet maybe four times a year. You know, so you have a progressive agenda that you can keep working at to build mutual trust and some mutual activities. Okay? Uh, on the military side, as I said, our military is interact 
virtually not along. I'll wrap up on this because it's 531, I see back there. Uh, uh, we hold more than 300 multilateral military exercises in Asia every year. We have almost one a day. Some of these are very large scale. Some of them are you know, much, much more modest, over 300 a year. We generally invite the Chinese to none of them. Every other country in Asia, with the exception maybe of Laos and Cambodia. No, Cambodia is involved. Maybe Laos is the only exception. Uh, every other country in Asia is involved. Right? So uh, we, the biggest of these is called RIMPAC. Uh, uh, we have now invited the Chinese to be an observer at the next RIMPAC exercise. This brought together 24 countries the last time it was held. Right? The Chinese were the only real excluded people. Uh, the president can use waiver authority. Believe it or not, the Congress has, has stipulated that we may not invite the Chinese to any military exercise. That's a great way to build mutual trust, isn't it? Uh, but the president has waiver authority uh, on that decision. I think he should use his waiver authority to invite Chinese, at least observer status, in a selected, gradually increasing array. I don't mean 300, I mean three maybe building to five, maybe building over time to 10 military exercises, because it's vitally in our interest that they have some understanding of what we're doing uh, through observation and talking with the people involved. Believe me, we know how to run these exercises without, without giving away any secrets. You know, we've got that down pat. Uh, so inviting their participation would potentially give them a sense of buying and make it feel as if we are not trying to hold them down and exclude them, we're trying to build them into a dynamic dimension of the Asian region. So I think there's a lot we can do. I think we need to get started on doing it. And let me say there's a huge burden here on the Chinese side to step up and understand that this is in their interest too and be adequately responsive. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attention. Terrific and very timely. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank all of you for joining us and for a really wonderful set of questions. I'm sorry we're out of time because I know there were none, a number left. I hope you will come back and join us for other policy talks at the Ford School. Um, just a final round of thank you to Ken Lieberthal. Oh, thank you.